Welcome to the session on Python data handling techniques for Oracle Database. My name is Christopher Jones. I'm a product manager in the database team, and I look after some of the database access APIs in the scripting language area. Most of this demo today will be code which is run. I just have a quick slide here of the architecture of the CX Oracle module for Python. That's the module which has all of the fancy code which talks through to the Oracle client libraries, which then connect through to Oracle database. So your applications make calls to CX Oracle, which implements the Python DB API with very few permissions and very, very many extensions for all the great Oracle features. So today we will talk about what's new and improved, a quick session on what's happened over the last year, and then get into the meat of the talk about the getting and putting of data into the database. Finally, I'm going to speak about something which is new and exciting coming up, so you know what to look forward to. Let's run some code, or rather, let's talk about what's new in Python Oracle CX 8.2. What's new in Python CX Oracle 8.2? So this was a release in mid-year, uh, not a huge bunch of changes. It was a point X release. The key thing which I think you will be interested in is this improved dead connection detection. And if you have code which used to check for errors like R3113, you should migrate that to now look for this DPI 1080. Now the text of that the message, the new message, will actually contain the R3113 if, if that was the error which, which generated a dead connection if network had dropped out or a database administrator had killed a session. Now your apps have a single error message which you can check instead of having to try and keep track of all the, the changeable Oracle database error messages. Uh, a couple of other things in the session pool change. There's a great new pool reconfigure option if you want to keep your apps running but want to actually change the sizes of the, the pool, for example. You can now do that at runtime without having to bring the app down. And a couple of extra caching features went in internally. Uh, which make a great difference if you're using Oracle's document store, this Soda, simple Oracle document access store, which by default stores JSON documents. If you're using that, then definitely upgrade to the new version because you'll get much better performance. A few stylistic changes. One uh, is that some of the parameter names, particularly around the connection, now, <laughs> now uh, follow the PEP8 guidelines, Python's PEP8, and they have underscores instead of camel case. But don't worry, the old names still work. As part of this, we want to just make you aware that the Python DB API standard for parameter order is actually different to the one which CX Oracle implemented way back when CX Oracle was first started decades ago. Um, so we do recommend using named parameters, which insulate you against any changes if we ever, ever, for whatever reason, decide to change parameter order to be more standard with the, the DB API. Bunch of other changes went in as well. Check out the release notes. Let's get into this. We don't have a lot of uh, time today. Uh, I'm using, if you haven't seen it, this is a what they call a Jupyter notebook. So it lets me have runnable code in the presentation, uh, but it does mean there's a lot of code on the screen. So just bear with it and try and focus on the, uh, the bit with the blue bar that I'm talking about. So I'm going to talk, talk about connections, as you can see in the head. And the first thing, of course, is how do we connect what well, we need CX Oracle? It's stored on the Python package index repository, PyPy, and therefore you can use the pip command to install, a pip module to install CX Oracle. If you don't have access to this privileged directories where Python's installed, you can install any of these modules, Python modules, in your own user space. If you're behind a firewall, then you might want to use a proxy setting as we do here you know, in the Oracle corporate land, we always use a proxy. So you install CX Oracle, and then you have to get some of the client libraries. I showed you that architecture diagram before. If Python is on a different machine to your database, the easiest way to get those client libraries is the Oracle Instant Client. You may be familiar with this. You can just download the basic, or the basic light package from our OTN page, Oracle Technology page, and you can even automate that now. There's no click-through required. Um, Instant Client's available on all of the platforms. Um, Mac OS, for example, there's a DMG package which is signed, so you can install that easily, which you can also automate. Instructions are on the, the download pages. If you're on Linux, then you have one extra choice, and we have a YUM Oracle server, and you can get packages there for 
Python for instant client for CX Oracle, so you can have everything managed through the, the YUM or DNF system. So you've installed CX Oracle, you've installed instant client, how do you make the two talk together? We need to load those client libraries. As of CX Oracle 8, there's a new instant, sorry, a new init Oracle client method, and you can on Mac OS, Darwin, Windows, you can just pass the directory where those libraries are located using whatever current version is available at that time. Unfortunately, on Linux, for various reasons with the uh, one of the libraries in the instant client, you still need to set system library search path in your preferred manner before you start the Python process. You can also do this, you can set on Windows, you can also set the path environment variable to this directory before you start Python, just as you have traditionally been able to. So you've now got everything installed. How do you connect? Well, here I'm just going to run through. Yes, we have a username and password for the database. Um, you don't have to hard code the password. You can use, obviously, an environment variable or something like external authentication. And that's our recommended method, so avoid leaking your credentials. Uh, syntax is fairly standard Oracle, mostly you know, the C side syntaxes, which you would have used in things like SQL Plus. This is the easy connect syntax. So you have the host name, local host, a database is running locally, and the service name is available here. And as you can see, I'm using the named parameter syntax. So it doesn't matter which order I put these. This example doesn't do anything fancy, just prints out the connection object, as you can see where it's connected to. Could use a TNS alias if you have any of those configuration files, like a TNS names that are a file. Um, don't need to have that file if I'm using the easy connect syntax. Oracle Client 19 introduced an enhancement, significant enhancement to that syntax. It now has easy connect syntax. It now has extra options using a kind of URL format with the ampersand and the question mark. So you can stick some of these extra options, which before 19C, you would have had to have had those configuration files separately. Now you can re remove most of the need for having those separate files just by using these options at connect time. So just rushing through in the time standard connections you saw above, just a straight connect call, opens up pipe to the database, starts up a server process. When you're finished with it, you close the connection, the server process disappears. Obviously the yellow dot on Python disappears. So um, that's a, a standard single one-to-one -one connection. We see a lot of that, but most people actually want to be using pooled connections. So pooled connection is a number of connections and the pool can grow or shrink. Um, typically you create this at process startup, application startup, number of connections in the pool will be created. And then when your application starts servicing your user requests, so when the, the application says, give me a connection, this pipe is always, always already established, server process has already started, and the application performance is improved. So we'd use a pool when you had a large number of users or not large number of connection requests going in at a time, typically when they're being used for a short period of time. Um, when you want to take advantage of Oracle features which are supported with the session pool, such as our high availability features, the session pool will do runtime load balancing connection load balancing if you have multiple database instances. It supports our application continuity and our database resident connection pooling, which I won't talk about today. So some of the higher end features. It also supports things like our fanned events, fast application notification events for down planned, down maintenance. So it can more gracefully handle that. So most users I think will want to be using a connection pool or session pool. I use those terms interchangeably. Uh, there's a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence here in the Python land. So how do you do this? You, at application start, create a session pool. And you give your various parameters about how you want the pool to behave. How many connections do you want to be created at start? How many do you want maximum to be allowed? And when a pool needs to grow, how many it's going to create? So this pool might have started with one connection. And then second user came in, and because the increment says one, it's added an extra connection into the pool. When the application is finished with these, closes them from the application point of view, connections just go back into the pool for reuse by the next person in the application who wants a connection. So looking at the code, 
we do the with here. The with is convenient because it does that release automatically for you, so you don't need to do the explicit connection.close. So it acquires a connection from the pool, and then we can do something with that connection. So the code from here on is the same, exactly the same as if it was a standalone connection. But once we're done, we just release it back to the pool, and it remains pipe remains open across to the database for the duration of the Python process or until the pool gets closed. One pro tip is use a fixed pool site. Oh, you can see I just ran it there and it actually ran and got the connection and printed out and got a connection. So the, the pro tip I was speaking about, professional tip, is use a fixed size pool. And this is particularly important to avoid connection storms. You don't want to come in in the morning, find the pool has shrunk back down and pool needs to grow, so it needs resources to be allocated, but other people are actually trying to do work and they're trying to use database resources at the same time. So you want that pool to be a fixed size so you don't get these connection storms. One extra great tip for working with a connection pool, session pool, is that when connections are released back to the pool, they retain session state. Now they don't say contain transaction state, your transaction will get rolled back if you haven't committed it but they contain session states such as these NLS settings, which you, you can see in red. So typically a user would, or an application would get a connection from the pool, try and set some state to make sure you know, it, was, it was what the application expected, then use a the connection, then release the connection. So if you do that, then you have to keep running these alter statements every time you acquire a connection from the pool. We can avoid the overheads of having to do that every time you want to use a connection by using a callback. And this says that the very first time those connections are created, remember the connections are created and then retained in the pool, very first time those connections are created, we run this callback. And obviously in this case, it sets a couple of NLS settings. So this callback will get called, you know, in the, the typical case, four times, because we only have to have four connections in the pool. But everybody else who does the pool.acquire is always going to have those settings available. First time pool connection gets used, callback gets called, and then session gets changed, and then the pool.acquire returns the connection to the user. And after that, when the user closes a connection, this state is returned, and the init session doesn't ever need to be called again, because that connection already has that state. So a quick look at that down here is maybe a little dummy example of you know, an app which calls pool.acquire a thousand times. You have a thousand web requests come in, perhaps. Pool is going to be the same size. But if you don't have the callback without the callback, you're going to have to do that alter statement a thousand times explicitly. Maybe your app does a thousand queries as well. So you get a thousand alters plus a thousand selects. So you get 2000 database statements. But if you look at the lower row where you do have the session callback, you only need to call that alter or it gets called for you once per connection in the pool. So you get the four, four calls here. And obviously the database calls you have half the load means the database can go and service other people for the work they want. So your database is more efficient, needs fewer resources, can handle more people. Moving on, just looking at autonomous database. The key thing here that's different about connection is that it uses wallets. This gives mutual TLS, so you get the enhanced security across the network. So if you create a database and you can easily get one through our always free service, which is, as it says, is always free, um, go and click a few buttons to create a database. And then if you want to access it from CX Oracle, we need to download that wallet for mutual TLS. So on the console, we would find the DB connection button. We click that and we get another dialog which would let us download the wallet. This is a zip file. And here I'm just getting the zip file to connect to my one database instance. I would then unzip that file. There are a couple of other files there we don't need, but the three files which can be used with CX Oracle are the connection configuration files and our wallet file for TLS. You want to keep that wallet secure. Now you still need username and password, so it's not an auto login wallet. So here I'm just getting my password from an environment variable. And in this example, I'm not actually using TLS names that are all the SQL net are files. I'm using easy net, easy connect syntax. So secure protocol, and I've, I've peeked into the TNS names of our file and got these components out. That was this um, database uh, the host name is the port, is the service name. And then you can see I've got this extra syntax on the end, wallet location. 
So this directory, cjdb melb, is where I've got my SSO file. And then because I'm in a firewall, I've added some proxy settings on the end to punch out through that firewall. Now, I wouldn't use the proxy settings in a production application for performance reasons, but obviously in testing, it's perfectly usable. So again, um, you could have used TNS names at Aura, decided not to, and I was just able to add this wallet location, which is the directory where I have my SSO file. So let me run that and see how it goes. And yes, connected through the database, selected user from Joule, and printed out my username. So a couple of clicks and some configuration, in this case, just extracting the um, connect string syntax, got me connected through very easily to my always free database. Let's move on and have a look at queries, which in Oracle land, we tend to be very specific and say they're select in the with statements, not just any SQL statement. Uh, and I've got the setup here, which we can skip just for this process and run that. And I can just talk about round trips. You see this come up a few times in the session, that round trips, very important to reduce them for scalability. And a lot of the design we do in Oracle is around reducing round trips, being able to piggyback messages backwards and forwards across to the database. So round trip would go across the database. The database listener would have to wake up. There'd be interrupts, memory allocated, um, couldn't handle anybody else's requests. You know, messages would come back. You want to reduce that so the database can be efficient and handle other people's requests. So fetching rows, I won't go into this in detail, but if you scan down, you can see these three blocks. There's a fetch one, there's a fetch all, and there's a fetch many. So we've got three different ways we can fetch in the database. Um, you can see the cursor.execute, so we get a cursor. If you haven't used, seen that before, we get a cursor, just like the construct we use in CX Oracle. Execute our statement, and then we start fetching data backwards, back from the database. Obviously, if we want one row, we can use fetch one. If we want all the rows, we can fetch all. And if we want, we may as well just run that, so we get one result back. If run that one, get all the results back. But if you've got a huge table, you might need to do batches of fetch many. So you loop through. By default, it fetches um, value of cursor dot array size, and you can tune, and I'll show later, number of rows. And if we got fewer rows than that, obviously there couldn't have been anything left in the table, so we can just break out of our loop. But if we wanted 100 rows, and we've got 100 rows, we need to go through the loop to see if there's 101st row somewhere. So we can just process these rows in any way that we like. So the key thing is round trips. We spoke about that before. So here's a little bit of framework code where I'm going to calculate that, and I can get that from a system V$ table. Uh, but to know which row I want to check in that V$ table, I have to find my session ID. So I'm, I'm getting my session ID from database. And then as a system user, system connection, I'm doing that query from the V$ tables for my particular session, and I'm getting the round trips. So if I scroll down a little bit, where I have my actual query. You can see at the top, getting current set of round trips, and down here I'm getting the difference. And so that's the number of round trips that my workload took. And here I'm just selecting a bunch of rows and changing various sizes of prefetch rows and array size. So let me run this, and you can see obviously we've got in up here the calls, and here's the output. So you can just look at the output. So these are the default prefetch and array size values. And what are these, these values? These are internal tuning values. So these affect the buffer sizes within Oracle libraries. And there are two different parameters because there are two different layers and two different kinds of buffering. A little bit complex about whys and wherefores, but one has an extra memory copy and is used the first time and the other is used for the second fetches and whatever else. Um, fundamentally though, just take your queries in your production environment, choose the values and do some testing and, and work out which values work for you. So these are the default values. And you can see that if I'm just fetching a single row from the database, as, as many queries are, the default values work fine. It just takes one round trip to the database for the whole query. I do the select and I get the data back and that's the round trip. Once I start bumping up the number of rows, then the number of round trips starts increasing, which is you know, something I could tune. And the first tuning example is I'm getting a, a page of rows. So you know standard web page data. Um, in this case, I'm getting 20 rows. And I've chosen a couple of values, and you can see that the second 
set of values, I've reduced the round trips. And there's this little odd quirk that there's an extra check for the end of fetch when that buffer size is full. So just by setting prefetch rows to one greater than the number of rows we want to check, um, then I've actually reduced back down to that one round trip maximum scalability for the database. So we'd use this if you knew exactly how many rows you're getting back and it wasn't you know, very, very large. But if you are getting a large number of rows, then you can start playing around and as I said, go into your production environment because that has the unknown network latency, which will be different from your development environment. Um, data sizes may be different. Go and tune your values of these and reduce the round trips. And if, uh, I'll show you later round trips and performance and uh, there's a correlation, so you really want to reduce the round trips. You may find for huge data sets, the prefetch row size of default is fine too, and then you just play with array size. Let's go on into inserting again. I've got my scaffolding code, so this uh, separate process works. I've just got a little dummy table that I'm creating. And always worth speaking about binding. So binding protects you against SQL injection attacks. We don't want to see you concatenating data into the query or the insert statement or whatever you're doing and executing that because that means that somebody could put something bad in your data and it gets executed as part of the SQL statement. Binding keeps the data separate from the SQL statements. Also important for performance and scalability because the database can reuse concepts such as curses. So in Python code, there are various syntaxes you can use for binding. Uh, this is at the top is the SQL statement, and this is the bind syntax, bind variable. So Oracle uses a colon with a, a name. And then actually when you're executing that SQL statement, you can pass in values. And these are, as I say, separate to the SQL statement, go across the network separately. It's by position because there's no name associated here. And obviously one just goes to the first value, string two goes to the data value. Uh, it's probably preferable to use a dictionary and use named parameters. And that's because you might want to reuse a variable in the syntax and you don't want to have to repeat the data. Um, somebody may change the order of something, may cut out a, a name. It's much, much easier just to know that the mapping is uh, by name. And you can do something similar. You can uh, pass in infinite number of extra options, uh, extra parameters to the execute statement. Obviously, the names of those parameters match the, the data values, the, sorry, the bind variable names. So execute is great for insert, update, merge, whatever you want. Um, but if you're inserting, updating, deleting multiple rows, trying to match multiple rows of the where clause, we have an execute many function. And as you can see here, I can pass multiple rows, seven rows, with one call into the database. There's no looping here. It's just handled automatically. These seven rows are going to get inserted into the database. And at the bottom where I do the query, you can see that's exactly what happened. Very, very efficient. Let's have a quick look at a benchmark. Um, so again, scaffoldings, timing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the key interesting things here are that first case is looping over each row, lines 32 and 33. So I have to do a loop versus the second case down here on line 49, where I just do one execute many call, just pass all of the rows in at once. Let's run that. It takes a little while to run. And you can see at the bottom, uh, I'm going to get the data, print out the data, and then plot it at the end. So here, yeah, data's coming back. And the plot is being generated. And there's the plot. And if you look at the data for the 1,000 row case, inserting it's 1,000 rows, looping for execute took three seconds versus 0 0.09 for the execute many. Significant difference. Again, this, this blue graph just goes off the roof with large numbers of rows whereas the execute many much better, much more efficient, much faster, and everybody loves faster app. If you're inserting lots of data, then you're gonna to have to deal with noisy data. So execute many has a great way to, to sort that out for you. Here's an example, I'll just show you that the data that I'm uh, using, and I've got a parent and a child table. There's a, a key, common key between the parents and the children. And I'm going to insert some data. And it's got a bit of noise here. So I've got a duplicate key, 1018 is repeated. And this one, there's no parent, there's no 75 in the parent table. So let's just run that. And you can see, whoops, I got some errors. So error at offset two and offset four, which is zero, one, two. That's an error. 
three, four, that was an error. And I now get the choice of working out what I want to do with that data. But the other good thing, of course, is that extra data, the data which was valid, red, blue, yellow, got inserted. Okay, it's in the table. I can choose to commit or roll that back and ignore these errors, or I can fix these errors and reinsert these rows, and then commit all of the data at once. So batch errors mode here, batch errors true, handles that nicely for you working with noisy data. Note that even in auto commit mode, and by default, CX Oracle won't commit. So if you don't commit and you just exit, close the connection, then a rollback will occur. Um, but if you've turned on the auto commit mode, then if you get these batch errors, then that auto commit flag is ignored. Again, giving you the option to decide how to fix the data, which was not able to be inserted. And then you manually have to roll back or commit. In this case, I roll back so my demo can run a second time. So I've only got a few minutes left. Let me go straight into comma separated values. And we still see a lot of these around, even though it's not a well-defined standard. Um, so the unhelpful suggestion for us as Python programmers is don't use CSV at all. You know, just avoid it, store the data in the database, central source of truth, no impedance mismatch when you go from decimal data types to binary data types. Um, it's it's uh, generally what I would recommend. And you, we often see this with people trying to use Excel files. I mean, don't use and don't email around Excel files store things in Oracle Apex and, and have that single source of truth. But if you do want to use CSV files and you're loading them into the database, um, don't use Python, use Oracle Data Pump. So Oracle Data Pump does things like direct path load, can use external tables, which are probably the fastest way to load data if you can move that data to the database host machine disks. Um, so you've got a, a couple of options there. But as Python programmers, yes, we're going to be using <laughs> CSV files. You know, everything, everything looks like a, a now when we have a hammer. So Python has an extensive CSV module. Um, and just in the amount of time I've got available today, I need to focus on the way it would work with the CX Oracle module. So again, I've got my setup connection. No surprises there. Got a dummy table that I'm creating. Four columns, first name, last name, country, and a, and a key. And data in my external file, which is on disk, is pretty simple. So let's look at some code. Obviously, you have to import the CSV module. If your eye scans down, you'll see the execute many. So we learned about execute many. Um, one thing we didn't discuss before was this use of set input sizes. So execute many needs the data in each column, the allocated memory in each column, to be the same size. So when we're scanning the data file to use for CX Oracle Execute Many, it's going to look at these data sizes and see that the second row is bigger than the first, but the thread is smaller than Henry. So it might have to reallocate memory for Henry. And that can be expensive if you have a large number of rows. So up front here, we're just telling CX Oracle, we're never going to have more than 30 characters for those character columns. None here just says, you know, use the default which for a number type, you know, we don't need to specify the, the width. It's always got a fixed size in Oracle. The other thing with, with loading data is that we probably can't load all of the data at once, I and mean, we can't just flood everything across the network. So we're going to have to do it in batches, and the batch size here is 10,000. So if you look inside the loop here, you can see we're building up some, some kind of data array. I'll, I'll look at, show that in a minute. And then every time it reaches the 10,000, you know, when we divide and division it as, uh, as it comes out to zero, uh, then we just call execute many and insert that those 10,000 rows, and then we keep looping for the next 10,000. So the first thing, obviously, up here on line nine is to actually open that CSV file, standard Python syntax, and then we can just pass that file handle into the CSV reader, tell it what delimiter the file has, and loop over, so it becomes an iterable, and we can loop for every line in that. So the line becomes an array, and the array entries are the columns of the data in the data file. Build up 10,000 rows of data in the data variable, and then we do the insert. At the very end, we might have a few left over. We don't have an even multiple of, of 10,000 rows, so we do one final execute menu. And we can run that, and then obviously when we do the query, we can get those two rows back. So let's look at writing files. 
Uh, this example, I've put the time module in so that I can do the time and show you how cursor array size affects time. So we saw round trips before, cursor array size is going to affect querying the database, and here we're selecting data from the database. And we need to be efficient when we do that, so we bump up array size. So let's just run this. And yes, we wrote 10,000 rows, 0.73 seconds. Let's drop this down to 10 and run it again. And yep, much slower that time. So when you're writing, and again, this was very straightforward, standard Python open syntax, create a CSV writer. I'm in the Linux Mac space, so I'll just like a simple line feed return instead of a carriage return line feed. And then we can pass the results down into results of our query down into the um, writer module. Right. And uh, just at the bottom, I'm doing a word count minus lines just, just to confirm that yes, actually we write those 10,000 rows. So time is short, so let's talk about what's new and exciting. I'm pleased to announce that we are working on a thin driver for Python. This is equivalent to the JDBC type 4 driver, so you're not going to need to install Oracle Instant Client. Now we have a long way to go with this and uh, need to do some technical work and we need to do some of the business approval work. Uh, but we're looking forward to bringing it to you sometime in the next year or so. As you know, in Oracle, I'm not allowed to give you any finer grained timeframes and um, getting your feedback on some early releases before we gradually and continually keep improving it and adding more and more features. But it'll be great. It'll be very lightweight, very easy to install, no need to install Instant Client. And obviously, if you do want the full feature set, which Oracle provides through all of those client capabilities which are available in, in the Oracle client libraries, you can use the, the, the thick client, continue to use the thick client, or you can choose to use the, new, use the new thin client as you like. So look forward to bringing that to you and working with various communities to make sure that all your popular frameworks work with that. And that's it. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me.